All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Boise City Planning and Zoning Commission work session. We've got a busy work session this evening. We are going to be hearing two presentations on uh, pathways and policy, pathway policies and programming, one from Ryan Head with the Ada County Highway District, and then one with Dane Hoskins, our City of Boise Pathways Manager. Um, and then after that, we will go through agenda review. So to kick us off, we've got Ryan right here. And go ahead. All right, I, I failed at my first test. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Commission. Uh, for the record, Ryan Head, Deputy Director of Development and Technical Services at the Ada County Highway District. Uh, this, the city invited me here today to present on ACHD's new pathway policy, which was adopted into our development policy um, late last year. Uh, this was a, a directed change following up on, on some actions SHD's commission has taken to uh, increase the number of multi-use pathways adjacent to the right-of-way um, with SHD's projects. So in order to ensure that that continues as, and is in, integrated into what we require as part of the development process, um, we have updated our development policy to include this. And I'll present what was adopted here today. All right, I've, so just to give an overall vision of what we are trying to accomplish with this policy, the, the policy has a variety of different components with the end vision of creating uh, along uh, appropriate roadways, primarily arterials and collector roadways, um, a multi-use pathway. Um, our definition of a multi-use pathway is a minimum of 10 feet um, it uh, that runs parallel to the roadway. The policy also encourages an eight foot buffer between the pathway and the roadway, uh, encourages the use of vertical elements, street trees. Um, in doing this, it moves the bike facility off the, off the roadway surface and into that pathway. And then, so that creates a narrower cross section of the roadway. And then it also, the policy incorporated some some details regarding the design speeds of roadways. Um, this was the timeline. So it, it took about three or so months to, to develop. We visited with a number of different groups in this process, uh, met with city staff as well. Um, and then it was taken to a public hearing back in September and adopted unanimously. The, as mentioned, the policy um, focuses on arterials and collector roadways, so your more major roadways. Um, didn't want to try and force this onto local streets uh, or where your residential houses are. Um, it also connected the multi-use pathway um, to Idaho law. Idaho law has the description of a public roadway including um, sidewalks and side paths. So this, this ties that um, to that, that definition of a side path and make sure that we are staying in alignment and within our jurisdiction there. Um, so what it did is it gave the opportunity um, for the requirement of a 10 foot multi-use pathway. Now, I'll, I'll note that many of the cities and I believe um, city of Boise with the adoption of their pathway plan already were requiring some of this. However, ACHD had no tool to require it previously. And so um, with this change, we now can require a 10 foot multi-use pathway um, in lieu of the sidewalks and bike lanes. It does put the discretion on, on ACHD staff for determining what is the appropriate facility. Now, this is primarily tied to areas where there's a lot of redevelopment occurring. Um, the, the general thought here is if you have a piece of property with a very short uh, frontage, say 100 feet, as opposed to a quarter mile or half a mile of frontage, um, it, it may make sense to just tie into the existing facilities that are there and with the plan and the intent that the, the pathway would be implemented through redevelopment of the roadway. One of the things that this also indicates is that we could require this on roads that are identified in our capital improvement plan. This is our 20 year um, plan 
of, of roadways that we anticipate having some major modification um, connected to development there. Um, I noted the reduced pavement width uh, when a pathway is installed as well as that there be an eight foot buffer and that was a requirement of the eight foot buffer. It updates our right of way preservation widths um, with the through development, we require a certain amount of right of way for future development of a roadway. Um, the what we were requiring through development did not match what our 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 planning map showed, and so we wanted to make sure that that was um, incorporated into the policy. Um, as pathways approach intersections, um, in particular. Um, minor street intersections, not at a signal, but unsignalized intersections. Um, there is some jogging of the pathway to push it away from the roadway. Um, this increases visibility, um, slows uh, the, and gives more opportunity for turning vehicles to see those who are crossing at the pathway, as well as um, slows the, the, the pace of, of those riding or, or walking in those locations so that there's better visibility for all. Um, now, from a development perspective, that does require some additional right away right at the corner. So we know that that's that's part of that requirement. Um, as as these pathways transverse medians, um, sometimes at the entrance of a development, you may have a a monument a median there. Um, this makes sure that the pathway stays at the full ten foot width going through those. Um, as we talked about collector roadways. Um, we we set the the requirement that they be designed to a speed of 25 miles per hour. Um, historically, it was a little bit higher than that. Um, we there are some cases in which we said it could go up to 30 miles per hour. Generally, what this will do is it will will determine how how the intersections are treated and the radius of the of the of the the curbs at the at the intersections. So. Um, really, it's with the intent of trying to slow vehicles in those more uh, the, the collectors where you tend to see a lot more people walking or biking. We also added some design speed language for arterials. As most arterials exist today, it's hard to uh, redesign it to a, a different speed, but we did add some language about target creating a target speed of of 35 or no more than 35 miles per hour when, when we have frontage on these. If you are a, affecting an intersection um, with a development, um, that again would, would impact how you design that. But since most of these are straight, we, we tried to at least give some language in there to try and work with um, developments. Uh, we clarified what we mean by a meandering sidewalk. Really what we said is that the it needs to be parallel to the roadway without meandering um, with the exception of if there are a, a, a geographic constraint that requires it to meander in some form. And then we also added some language for our staff to give them the ability to modify a street section. So say you go a long distance without a driveway, is it absolutely necessary to have a center turn lane? The answer is no. And so, or if there's inability to get the 10 foot pathway and the buffers there, that we could look at either narrower roads or we could look at modifying that center turn lane for short distances um, in order to reduce the overall asphalt uh, footprint as well as to give the ability to um, to build really the smartest section that, that's the context of that area. Uh, with that, that's the summary of our pathway policy that we've adopted. I'm happy to take any questions that you all may have. Okay, great. Thank you for the summary and the review. Any questions, team? One or two, I'm sure. Yeah, come on. yeah let's do it, Chris, please. <clears throat> First of all, uh, thank you for coming, Brian. Appreciate you being here. Um, a few questions. Um, I would love this to cover, first of all, the eight-foot buffer. So you mentioned a vertical element is encouraged. So what does that mean? Because street trees has, have historically been a topic of, of, you know, a bit of conflict, as I know. I don't know if the policies have shifted or anything, but what does that mean exactly that vertical elements are 
encouraged? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Danley, the the policy as it states indicates that street trees would be re, um, are encouraged when they will be maintained by the adjacent property owner um, or the the corresponding city. ACHD within our enabling legislation um, has limitations on landscaping and what we can do. However, uh, we wanted to include language that said vertical elements because if it goes below eight feet, um, we want to identify other types of treatments that could go in that space to provide greater protection. So we're saying it's required at eight feet, but if there's some land use constraint that makes it so that we need to narrow that up, we at least have an opportunity to still provide some barrier um, besides horizontal separation, provide some vertical break there. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, if I can mm -hmm. continue, um, I'm curious, I know that obviously if a road is in the CIP, it's, you know, four lanes and it's going to go to five, seven, whatever ultimately the configuration is, this was a pretty ripe opportunity to get a pathway like that done. Eustick, a road like Eustick, for example, mm -hmm. where for all intents and purposes, I don't know if there's any seven lane section in the CIP, but otherwise it's five lanes and it's what you would quote unquote say done. Mm -hmm. How is the district handling arterial sections that have recently been completed and are not in the CIP anytime soon when it comes to this policy? Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Danley, the policy also gives opportunity and incorporates some of the other treatments that were, were identified in our bike master plan, including protected bike lanes, um, raised bike lanes, other types of treatments. So staff has the opportunity to, to consider, um, again, based on the context, whether we, we require a developer to incorporate some of those treatments um, into a roadway that's currently built out. So at a minimum, what we said is that they would incorporate a buffer, um, which is just paint on the surface, um, but some some distance. Um, usually it's at least two, um, two to three feet. Um, so this allows some of that to be incorporated. If it's long enough, we may require a, um, some vertical protection of some type of delineator or other type of treatment along the line um, or within that buffer. Um, so it gives the opportunity to to address some of those types of things on roads that are fully built out. Okay. It would require ultimately though movement of the curb line um, or if we can narrow up the, the roadway movement there too. So we'll have to look at those treatments on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, two more quick questions yep. if I can. Mm -hmm. um, so Ryan, when it comes to intersections, I'm gonna, I'm guessing and correct me if I'm wrong, but is the intent that the multi-use path be a facility that is intended for all users, bicyclists, walkers, et cetera. But in the bicycle realm, is the multi-use path going to be used in lieu of on-street bicycle facilities? Is that the general intent? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Danley, correct. There will not okay. be on-street bike facilities where we build these pathways. Okay. So then the question is at intersections, when we have a bike lane, a bicyclist is able to proceed depending upon the treatment of the at the intersection, there's a can potential change in a right-hand turn lane and can proceed on a green and all that kind of stuff. Whereas a bicyclist on the pathway that's going through the intersection on a green light and a right-hand turn. So I, I'm, I'm interested in the, the treatment of safety at the intersection when it comes to how is that going to be sort of addressed? If if the intent is to pull folks off the street, you know, whether it's protected or unprotected onto a multi-use facility in especially right-hand turning situations or left for that matter, really. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Danley, um, again, noting that this is a, a, a development policy. Okay. In most cases, developers aren't built, rebuilding our intersections. There are a few cases. Um, however, the way that the the this is set up is with those pathways and how they they jog it ultimately creates a what's considered in the industry a protected intersection where the vehicles will be stopped back away from the the ultimate turn and curb 
and the bikes and pedestrians will be placed farther forward so that and as as we are redoing intersections we're also implementing leading pedestrian intervals which is basically a head start um, for for those types of for those in the cross using the crosswalk and so in that case that gets them out ahead before those right turning vehicles um, would would be there and so okay. by giving that distance we also those who are choosing to turn right will be able to see um, the bicyclists and pedestrians farther ahead. My last question is, how can we help you? How can this body help ACHD achieve this policy? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner, uh, thank you. Thank you for the offer of help. And really, we believe that um, this is a partnership. Um, I think the connections to these pathways is going to be important into these developments and how those connect. And really, I think that's where, where Dane's presentation will come into play and making sure that we have those good connections, uh, supporting some of the requirements um, as there obviously will be pushback in different cases because it does take up a, it, it ultimately is trading five foot of bike lane and five foot of sidewalk to 10 feet um, together. So it's, it's not a, a major change in terms of the amount of right of way, but it's it's important um, to make sure that these ha things happen and we have a good transition between existing facilities and these other things. So as you see those questions and some of the pushback, just providing some of the education as to why um, some of these this type of treatment is important for the city um, to those who come to your hearings will be a valuable partnership. Excellent. Very good. Okay. You good, Chris? Okay. Got uh, Commissioner Mooney has his hand up. John, good evening to you. Good evening. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Hey, Ryan, mm -hmm. good to see you again. I got a question um, similar to Chris's uh, about how can we help, which is uh, when we get development applications and sidewalks are our standard almost monthly battle with the, with the public regarding um, applicants not wanting to put in sidewalks, for example. This is a big chunk, a multi-use path and a pretty significant streetscape change. Can you give us a sense of what the highway department's view is on how much of this we should be piecemealing? And maybe it's a better question for Dane. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Mooney. Um, the... The, this really is going to occur on a piece by piece basis with our, our staff looking at each development and determining what exists there today. Um, I'll tell you, we'll probably be requiring more where an existing facility doesn't exist on either side or when it's a larger piece of property. Um, if it's smaller, you're more likely to have little little pieces um, or, or you're more likely to have a sidewalk and just extending existing facilities. And so we're trying to balance those two things. Um, I think the areas, and I I truly hope the pushback that you, you get with regards to sidewalks is more on local streets and not on <laughs> your arterials and collectors, because if, if, if we're failing to get them there, then we have other things to be concerned about. Um, and that's where this this policy relates to the arterials and collectors. Um, but ultimately, we do want to see um, the sidewalks where where appropriate. Obviously, on your local streets and as you redevelop in, in, in existing neighborhoods, it's it, it gets to be more of a context related conversation. Mm -hmm. And we, we just have to work together as, as our staffs. And that's really my commitment um, from our, our side is that we will work with your staff and look at each of those um, case by case and determine what's the right solution. Great. Anything else, John? No, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Any other questions? Okay. All right, Ryan, appreciate your time. Thank you for the update. Testing, testing, maybe. There we go. There it is. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dane Hoskins. I'm the Pathways. 
Sorry. I'm the Pathways Program Manager at the City. Um, I'm going to give a pretty brief and high-level overview of the Pathways Program and the progress that has been made in standing up that program and implementing the Pathways Plan in the last year. Um, we're going to start with just a very brief background on kind of what the Pathways Plan is, where it came to be, what it's hoping to accomplish, before looking at sort of the program and just its scope. Um, we'll look at how projects are implemented before turning towards kind of some of our current projects and what our next steps are moving forward. I'm sure you all have seen this a lot. This is the Pathways Master Plan. It was adopted in January of 22. Uh, it envisioned something like a 160 mile pathway network building on the success of the Boise River Greenbelt. Um, it considers facilities along riparian corridors, so rivers, roadways, through parks and open space, um, and would connect people to destinations they wanna go to like jobs, schools, community destinations, and like natural amenities. Um, progress towards implementing this plan would really represent a significant step forward in the city's goals and priorities around mobility, climate equity, and safety. So before we go too much further, I'm gonna kind of define some terms around pathways. Um, when I speak about pathways, what I mean is a separated facility away from the right of way. Again, 10 to 12 feet is our standard. They can go much wider, but that's sort of where we start. Um, the green belt is the er example in this community of what a pathway is. Similar but separate are side paths. These are the kind of facilities uh, contemplated by that ACHD pathway policy. These run along roadways. Um, again, that vertical element separation is key because you still ha are near that uh, moving motor vehicle, I don't know, safety consideration. Um, and the last component of that, of that network is our sidewalks and bikeways. So these are our on-street facilities, our bike lanes, um, and our pedestrian facilities. So the point in bringing these th three things up is they're, they're, they're different, they're separated, but they need to function together as a network. So what the pathway plan begins to do is call out the opportunities for pathways and then look at what are some of the connective tissue that we need to bring those opportunities and actually connect them to residents and schools and grocery stores. That's where the pathways program comes in. So some of the first recommendations in the pathways plan are um, to really develop that vision for the broader network. Again, building on that opportunities analysis and expanding that into a coherent citywide network that gets people where they wanna go. So holding that vision is the first job of the Pathways program. And from that kind of begins to flow the prioritization, project selection, and ultimately implementation of Pathway projects and some of the other infrastructure needed to support those. So there are three main ways a pathway gets implemented. Um, the first is through the development review and entitlement process. The second is through coordination with our partner agency projects. And the third is city-led capital projects. And we'll kind of take each in turn. Um, I think I understandably am going to linger on the uh, entitlement and development review side of things a little more. So looking there first, this is where the Pathways Master Plan really integrates with the Modern Zoning Code rewrite. Um, I'm going to get some of my numbers right here. Obviously, we have a new code, which allows us through our kind of pre-submittal applicant coordination to connect with developers at the earliest stage, the conceptual stage, and identify here's what the pathway plan is going to need. Get that on the plans early. Get that understanding built early so that it's less expensive and you don't have to redesign an entire site later on. Um, and that's kind of complemented by much stronger ability to require the minimums that we need for the pathways plan. So those things kind of work together of like, make sure it's clear early and make sure we have the tools to get what we need. And, and we can have a lot of say through that new code on the easements and location and clearances and kind of some of the design and layout and widths and a lot of the specifics that we're gonna to want to make great facilities in this way. Again, I, I think like just a, an ER example of, of this working really well is through the CWI campus expansion project on the intersection of Maine and Whitewater. Um, this is a complicated facility. There are ACHD facilities, there are VRT facilities, there's a pathway that we're looking at making a connection to, there are schools and Greenbelt nearby. And through the IDR process, the interdepartmental review process, we brought stakeholders from every agency together, looked at the site as a whole and you know developed and, and built um, a site that functions for the city and for the residents and for the users really well. So I was actually really excited to see that. Um, I also just wanted to note, we're getting a lot of applications. I'm sure you're gonna to begin to see those soon if you haven't already. We've conditioned more than two and a half miles since the plan was published. And we've got another about seven tenths of a mile, three quarters of a mile kind of working through the system now. So 
really exciting stuff on that side. This is complemented by a lot of our partner agency uh, project implementation. We are, we are working all the time with our partners at ACHD to make sure that the Pathways Master Plan is visible in their planning and capital programming um, projects. This is really the process of building a shared vision for how the bike and pedestrian network is meant to work in the city, where we're trying to get to, the kinds of facilities we're trying to implement, what we want to try and what we need to know we need to hold as a minimum. Um, we obviously collaborate extensively during our capital planning. This is the integrated five-year work plan where we, the city, can offer comments and suggestions for what ACHD should consider as their priorities uh, for capital expenditure moving forward. And I think you'll actually begin to see some of the successes of this ongoing collaboration and coordination in more recent neighborhood ACHD plans like the West Bench plan. Um, I think that's something that specifically calls out a handful of Pathways Master Plan projects and is beginning to present some of that coherent network where we're we are identifying places to start. And the last is our city projects. I'll blow through these a little more quickly, just kind of giving a high level overview of each. Um, I do want to just note Park's great work in this space. They've been building most of the pathways that we've uh, built to date. Goddard Linear Park is a fantastic example of kind of the kinds of facilities we're imagining, and they're doing good work too. First project we're looking at is the Kasha Garden Pathway. The number, if you just look at proximity, is something like 11,000 residents would be served by this connection. If you extend that out to the bikeways that are under construction or currently constructed that this connects, it connects with something like 28,000 residents on the bench to the Greenbelt and nearby schools along those corridors. Um, this will take you from the Kasha Park Bikeway to the Garden Street Bikeway, which is currently under construction. Again, it provides that connectivity to a number of schools along the Kasha Park area. This is federally funded. It's undergoing the earliest stages of environmental review uh, now, which can get you through conceptual design. We expect that to, to continue through this year with public outreach kind of later in the summer. <clears throat> the second project is the Broadway Federal Way pathway connection. Um, similarly, this is kind of one of the, an interesting case study in bridging and knitting together communities that have been separated by infrastructure and topography. Mm -hmm. um, so you're coming down off of the existing Federal Way bikeway and finding a way to tie into the Leadville bikeway, which connects all the way up to the Greenbelt. Um, so this is really that central bench near near southwest neighborhood starting to knit together. Uh, we actually just got a contract signed. We're moving forward. We're doing the good things here. Um, sorry, big progress on our side. Uh, so we're in the early alignment selection phase. We've got a couple of different concepts we're looking at. Those will go to public outreach again this midsummer. Um, yeah, good stuff. Uh, the third project, and these are looking more at local funds, is the Tuttle Lateral. This connects to the Spalding Ranch Park site. Um, so <clears throat> Parks has done great work on the Spalding Ranch site and getting pedestrian connectivity through, but there's a tough pinch point right at the corner. And this is something where the Pathways program can come in and help solve pinch points, difficult instances that require real dedicated project management attention and sometimes consultant expertise to get through over around some infrastructure. Um, that'll then carry through the Capitol High and Milwaukee Park side of things, kind of increasing neighborhood connectivity through that site. This is funded through kind of our local funds, direct allocation for design this year. Um, and we're basically having ongoing stakeholder outreach right now. And the last project we're gonna talk about today is uh, the Spoils Bank pathway. It's labeled phase one because we have a, a broader vision for kind of the whole Northwest neighborhood um, connectivity and uh, along the Spoils Bank, um, it's actually a drain, the Spoils Bank yeah. Canal Network. Um, and that would run you all the way from Horseshoe Bend Road down to ooh, elementary schools. I think it's Cynthia Man Elementary School off of Castle mm -hmm. Drive. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you. That was a pop quiz. Mm -hmm. um, so again, similar, similar circumstance. We've got a, a single property owner uh, segment here, which is really exciting to us. That really lowers the complexity, direct connections to schools and parks. Um, we see this as being a real opportunity for a quick win and something we wanted to get under design and get into neighborhood discussion and planning now. With that, we'll look kind of quickly at some of our next steps. Um, I think the place to start is just making sure we're leveraging the opportunities that we have to move as quickly as possible. That of course is using our development and redevelopment opportunities to get the access that we need. 
Um, a, a lot of our barriers right now are coming down to making sure we can get property owners in a line to buy into the same vision and getting that public access that's required for a formal pathway of this nature. And if any one of those is missing, the whole connection falls apart. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's where it's really key that we are clear on what our requirements are and consistent in those being applied as developments come through. And then we're also leveraging kind of some other maybe more out of the box opportunities, thinking about unopened right of way on ACHD side and how can we develop license agreements and shared maintenance agreements or whatever that are required to open the spaces that are currently unopened um, for public use. They're already owned by the public realm. What connectivity can we make there? And kind of the second more boring bureaucratic side of it is just making sure we're developing and thinking through a clear project pipeline that gets you from where we are now, which is a pretty conceptual level plan and we're maturing projects systematically and making sure that every year and every time funding becomes available, we have a list of projects that we can come and we can build and those are always uh, maturing. So that looks like a systematic funding strategy and making sure we have the resources that we need, but also that kind of capital improvements plan and the ability to forward plan our maintenance needs and coordinating our implementation with our uh, agency partners and unlocking opportunities for each other. I'm gonna stop there and I'll answer any questions you all have. Okay, <clears throat> great. Thanks. Any questions? Mr. Chair. Yeah, please. Just two quick questions. Mm -hmm. Although I think, isn't that a picture of Milt with his ski poles and the bottom right? Is that Milt? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, quick questions, Dane. Um, one is, I, I'm curious the number of counters that have been put out on our system and what that's looking like. I know Compass, I think a while ago, funded some of those that tra at particular intersections and heads. What's the status of our counter system and what are the trends looking like? Great question. One I don't have the immediate answers to off the top of my head. I ran the Compass Counter Program when I was there previously. We had, man, I want to say 17 between the two counties and the vast majority of those were in Ada and most of those were in Boise. Um, I know ACHD has been installing as well, and we're sharing data across ourselves. I know Parks has installed four fairly recently, okay. and I've seen a couple on Ridge to Rivers facilities as well. So I would guess in the city we're up to more than 16 counters, but that's oh. a very back of the napkin number, and I'm happy to firm that up for you. Sorry. In terms of just tracking the progress, the tracking the numbers, it's super seasonal. I think that surprises no one. Right. We're entering the steep upslope of people going back out. I'm sure that's absolutely something you can experience. Um, there was a, a significant deviation during the COVID peak that saw usage at sort of peak weekday level almost all day long, almost year round during kind of some of the COVID weirdness, let's call it that. <laughs> and that has tailed off consistently since we have returned more to normal, but not completely. We've not returned to pre-pandemic levels. They're getting more usage than they did before. Um, those are super high level trends. I can look much more That's detailed right. and get something for you. We've also learned they're hard to maintain and it's hard to get consistent data for years at a time to do those kinds of comparisons. Right. Do you know anything about the ACHD counter program and have anything you want to share on that side? Sorry, pop quiz. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, ACHD has begun installing uh, permanent counters in connection with these multi-use pathways. So as we complete a, a mile long segment, uh, we've been begun adding these. We only have a few out there right now um, as this is, um, it takes time to deploy all these things, but the intent of that is to help us um, get a better understanding of utilization of, of these types of facilities. And is, is it helping? Yeah. Great, cool. I asked that question because as you know, the bar for pr burden of proof for funding when it comes to bicyclists and pedestrian types of facilities is a lot higher typically than it is for motorists. And the data is critical mm -hmm. in order to prove that point and to continue a program such as this. I know we're getting close to being out of time, so I'm not going to ask a question, but I want to bring up a point and I just want to kind of plant a seed for, for you all, probably both of you. I think it was a month ago we had an application or so in here that was up on State Street and kind of a complicated one. Um, I won't go into all the details, but the long and short of it was older lot. And because of the age of the lot and how a number of units and, or buildings were on it and all this kind of stuff, the path was required 
and that path and the and the setback requirements and parking and all of that kind of went into a as you would imagine a really complicated hopper and i think if i'm not mistaken the end of the day that didn't go anywhere and i think it part of it was because just not just the pathway but other things and so my point is you just stated it better than i could which is these these sections that don't get built due to the complexity of things end up being essentially a wall, right? And and so I know they're out there. I don't know where all of them are, of course, and I'm glad to hear you say that there might be a possibility to work with ACHD and the and the and the ultimate right of way to determine how that might be resolved because I'm sure that there's a number of those out there and we're only going to see more with the code update. Um, so I'm sure I'm certain those things are coming if they're already not on your desk as it is. So anyway, yes. thank you for your time. Thank you. I think John, you had your hand up. Did you have anything or you, did you pass it? I passed. Thanks. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Dane, thank you for the update. Thanks. Nice work. All right. That okay. was excellent. Um, we'll go right into uh, agenda review before we have a little break and start the meeting. Uh, short agenda today. Um, we are going to start off after we begin the meeting with uh, a small presentation by Mayor McLean. Um, after that, um, I believe we should hop right to item four. Um, that one has been withdrawn. It didn't get noticed, but um, might as well uh, let the, the community know that we won't be hearing that one today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, after that, we can add the four minutes for work session and regular meetings um, from March 4th and March 11th to the consent agenda. And then into our new business, we have uh, SOS 2326 from, with David Benoit. Um, revised findings are coming back um, for item A. We are recommending approval. As a reminder, that was at 3006 West Gerard Street, and that was that waiver to the subdivision ordinance requirement to construct sidewalk as part of a minor land division in an R1C zone. Um, that one can be added to consent if you all uh, are in agreement. Moving into our public hearings, we'll start with item one, CAR 2324. Uh, for Rodney Evans and Partners LLC. <clears throat> this is a legacy zone uh, zoning code item, and it's at 11800 West Overland Road. It's a rezone of approximately two and a half acres from R1B, single family residential of 4.8 units per acre to an R1C, single family residential at eight units per acre, and is accompanied by a PUD, PUD 2336, uh, for a planning development of 28 townhome units, and then also a subdivision the wingman sub, uh, just a prelim plat for those 28 buildable and eight common lots. We are recommending approval, but we did receive some public opposition, so we will be hearing that. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> Item two is a variance. It's CVA 2328 with Ethos Design and Remodel LLC. Uh, as a reminder, this was deferred from February 12th, 2024, and is a legacy zoning code item. It is addressed at 5115 West Ponder Street, and it's a variance to encroach the side setback on 0.22 acres in an R1C single family zone. We are recommending denial, so we will need to hear that one as well. And then last but not least is PUD 2333 for Leap Charities, Inc. This is another legacy zoning code item, and it is addressed at 3430 North Maple Grove Road. It's a conditional use permit for a residential plan development comprised of eight multifamily units on just under an acre at 0.94 in an R1C single family zone. We are recommending approval, but we did receive some public opposition. And so we will be hearing that one as well. So okay. just as a reminder, we'll start with the presentation from mayor um, and then move into item four's withdrawal. And you can build the consent agenda. Um, eligible again are the work session and regular meeting minutes from March 4th and March 11th, as well as item A. And then we will be hearing items one through three. And I will recuse on item three. Oh, whatever. <laughs> oh, you know you love uh, being chaired in me. So, okay. Yeah. Item three. Okay. Yep. Perfect. So I'll hand the baton off to Mr. Danley here. Okay. Give me a heads up, buddy. Yeah. You're Any welcome. other questions, comments, concerns? Actually, I forgot. Or we take a quick break. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Any questions? All right. Got 10 minutes. All Thanks, right. guys. Thanks, Crystal.
All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Boise City Planning and Zoning Commission public hearing. A few things to start out with for tonight's proceedings. Everyone from the public entering the hearing virtually has been automatically muted and cannot speak. As the item you're interested in comes up for discussion, you'll be called upon and unmuted. There is a chat function in Zoom, though this is not part of the record and should only be used if technical difficulties arise. Our procedures for public hearing begin with a presentation from the planning team. Then we'll go to the applicant and then the representative of the Registered Neighborhood Association, followed by questions from the commission. After that, we proceed to public testimony, starting with those who are in person, then who signed up on the sign-up sheet in advance, and then anyone else who raises their hand virtually. If you're attending through your telephone, you can type in star nine to raise your hand. And finally, each member of the public is allowed up to three minutes for testimony. We are strict with this time as it is limited in code. Um, after the applicant is allowed five minutes for rebuttal, after which the hearing will be closed and the commission will deliberate and render a decision. Mr. Chair, you have the floor. Thank you, Crystal. Good evening, everybody. We are citizen volunteers appointed by the mayor and approved by the city council. We make final decisions on conditional use permits, variances and appeals, and recommendations to city council on subdivisions, rezones, annexations, and code or compre comprehensive plan amendments. Any decision made tonight may be appealed to City Council, provided that the appeal is filed within 10 days of this hearing. In order to file an appeal, you must have given either written or oral testimony at tonight's hearing. Uh, that's why it's important to give your name and address when you testify tonight. We utilize a consent agenda. This means that if the applicant agrees with a staff report, and if there is no public opposition, the item will be placed on the consent agenda. All items placed on the consent agenda are approved with one motion without further public comment. For items not placed on the consent agenda, we will hold a full public hearing in the order detailed a few minutes ago with staff, applicant, and neighborhood association presentations, and then followed by public testimony. Thank you all for attending tonight. Will the clerk please call the roll? Schaefer. Here. Danley. Here. Moore. Here. Mooney. Here. Gillespie. Seha. Here. Torres. Here. Dome. Here. Seven present, one absent. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we get on to our agenda tonight, um, I believe we have Madam Mayor is here with us. We'd like to say a few words. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. I know you, you guys have a lot. Um, I was commenting on the um, script that you have at the beginning. Uh, when I was on Planning and Zoning Commission, we did not have to read something like that or oh. have those words. I was like, does he say this every time? <laughs> <laughs> I've just about got it memorized at this point. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you have. Um, I really, and John, good to see you remotely. Um, just wanted to come in and say, for, first off, I'm here too, because we've got an interim director um, that I know you probably know, but wanted to acknowledge his service. Um, but first to thank each and every one of you for your service. Uh, you spent, you put a lot of hours into this, whether it be in positions that you had for the city previously um, in your help on whether it be the zoning code or other efforts that we've had, um, or now as members of the Planning and Zoning Commission. I, I know that back in the day when I served on this commission, um, I both loved it and hated it. I loved it because the work is so important. It's meaty. It has such impact on the city as we grow, um, making sure that we protect the place that we love by um, planning and developing in a way that allows us to grow together as we grow up. Um, and that's why I loved it. I hated it because um, there were so many nights that were super, super late and I was exhausted and trying to sound smart and make good decisions and and all of those pieces that come with the service at this level um, that all of you are serving. This is really the, the commission, as you know, that makes um, and that has so much more weight than our other commissions. And so it's, it's a lot of work and I, and I value the effort um, and kind of heart and soul that you put into it. And thank you for that. Um, and as we work together to ensure that we're a safe and welcoming city for everyone, that as we grow, Boise remains Boise, you are on the front lines when it comes especially to our new zoning code. I don't know if you guys have new zoning code stuff yet. We're still waiting for, I'm still waiting on my agendas to get the note that um, new zoning code applications. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're still um, looking at applications from before the zoning code. I see um, Crystal says it might be very soon, um, very soon that we all <laughs> see that. Um, but I'm anxious and look for, not anxious in a bad way, but really look forward to hearing your feedback, learning from our staff, 
um, your experiences with our new code um, mm -hmm. to make sure that when we do the review at the end of this year, and that we're hitting the mark and, and seeing what we want to see. And so I look forward to and will value your feedback on that. Um, and as part of that, of course, we've got a great team that has um, been with us all along. Um, a leader of planning development services, director, Tim Keene, that's moved to mm -hmm. all, Calgary. Um, it's, I, I do wish that we'd had him for a little bit longer. He served well. I asked him to do three things. That was fix permits, um, pass modern zoning code, and support this team that's so important and um, believe that he did a great job in all those areas, was ready for a new challenge. And as we look for the next person, um, I asked Steve Bur Burgos to step in. Steve leads our public works department, um, has demonstrates day in, day out, uh, that he knows what it takes to run a department. Um, no, I I trusted that he had capacity. I, he's ex extending himself to have capacity to do both right now. Um, but appreciate your service and you'll see him and hear from him from time to time as well. Um, but with that, I just I want to leave you with a thanks. Um, as I started, a big thank you on the record to Steve for stepping in um, and, of course, to the staff that supports you and all of us as we make these decisions. Really appreciate it. Great. Madam Mayor, you're welcome anytime. Well, thank you. <laughs> you um, if I get a, what I will often say to somebody when they come for special businesses, you are excused. You don't have to stay till the very end. Oh. So I'm going to tell myself <laughs> that, I, tell, that it's okay that, please. If, I, if I excuse myself and not stay to the very end because I'll have a meeting late tomorrow night. Uh, appreciate each and every one of you. Really good to see you um, and look forward to talking more. Take care, everybody. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and move into our agenda tonight, which is relatively short. Um, one item to note right off the top is that item number four on our agenda has been withdrawn. Uh, that application has been withdrawn. That was CUP 23-62 um, at 7, uh, 7210 West Barrister Drive. So that item has been withdrawn, and we will not be hearing that item. And now we'll move into our consent agenda. We have a few items for consent uh, before we take up new business and hearings. Um, up first, we have meeting minutes. So without objection, I'll place our work session meeting minutes from March 4th on the consent agenda. I will also place our commission meeting minutes from March 4th on consent. And then our work session minutes from March 11th and our commission meeting minutes from March 11th also on consent. And then without objection, I will place item A on the consent agenda. This is uh, SOS 23-26. The applicant was David Benoit, Benoit at uh, 3006 West Gerard Street. Uh, these are rev revised findings from that hearing. Um, and that was a waiver to a subdivision ordinance requirement to construct sidewalk as part of a minor land division. So again, without objection, I'll place item A on consent. And at this time, I will entertain a motion regarding consent. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Danley. I'll make a motion that we approve the consent ag agenda consisting of the following items. Work session meeting minutes from March 4th. Commission meeting minutes also from the 4th. Work session minutes from the 11th. Commission meeting minutes from the 11th. And item A, SOS 23-26. A revised finding um, located at 3006 West Gerard Street, which was a waiver to the subdivision ordinance with its with its terms and condition in its respective staff report. Second. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Danley. And a second on consent um, by Commissioner Moore. Any further discussion on consent? Very good. Will the clerk please call the roll? Schaefer. Yes. Danley. Yep. Moore. Yes. Mooney. Yes. Seha. Yes. Torres. Yes. Doan. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. And we will move along to our first item tonight, which is item number one. Okay, we've got a rezone, a conditional use permit, and a preliminary plat. So CAR 23-24, PUD 23-36, and SUB 23-60. Uh, 
The applicant is Rodney Evans and Partners, LLC. The address is 11800 West Overland Road. Uh, a rezone of approximately 2.5 acres from R1B to R1C. A conditional use permit for a residential plan development comprised of 28 townhomes on 2.5 acres in the pending R1C zone. And then a preliminary plat for the residential subdivision of the 28 buildable and eight common lots. And as a note, this is our leg from our legacy zoning code. So uh, note there, and we're going to hear from staff first, Sabrina Mortensen. Hi, Sabrina. Hi. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. The item before you is a request to rezone approximately 2.5 acres located at 11800 West Overland Road from R1B to R1C. A conditional use permit for a residential plan development comprised of 28 townhome units and a preliminary plat for a residential subdivision comprised of 28 buildable and eight common lots are also included. The subject property is located at the northwestern corner of the intersection of Overland Road and Lozasso Avenue. Five Mile Creek abuts the site to the north and most of the site is located within the floodplain. The surrounding area is comprised of a mix of single family and multifamily residential uses with office and commercial uses located near the intersection of Overland and Cloverdale roads to the west. There is an existing bus route that runs along Overland Road adjacent to the site and there are multiple designated bikeways in the area as shown on this slide. The site is designated as suburban on the future land use map within which the proposed R1C zone is allowed. As detailed in your packets, the planning team finds that the R1C zone is the most appropriate for the site as it will allow for increased residential density in an area with existing transit service and proximity to services and employment opportunities. It will also provide a transition between the R1A and R1B zones to the north, south, and east, and the R3 and commercial zones to the west. The site is currently vacant and the applicant proposes to construct eight three-story structures containing a total of 28 townhome units on the site. The allowed density of the R1C zone is eight units per acre. However, the applicant requests to utilize a transit density bonus, which would increase the allowed density to 12 units per acre, as the subject property is adjacent to an arterial roadway with an existing bus route. With the transit incentive, the development complies with the allowed density of the proposed R1C zone. The proposal also complies with the height limit and all exterior setback requirements of the zone. Each townhome will have an attached two-car garage an additional parking will be available in a surface parking lot and along the private street. As detailed in your packets, the applicant requests to deviate from some of the dimensional standards of the zone as may be allowed through the PUD. The planning team finds the proposal to be consistent with the intent of the code as the requested deviations will allow the riparian area adjacent to Five Mile Creek to remain undisturbed and will facilitate the creation of shared open spaces and amenities throughout the development. Vehicular access to the subdivision will be provided by a private street access from Lazasso Avenue. As detailed in your packets, the applicant proposes to provide vehicular and pedestrian cross access to the adjacent parcel to the west, which was recently approved for a multifamily development. The applicant also proposes to replace the existing attached sidewalk along Overland Road with a 10 foot wide detached multi-use path to match the planned improvements of the adjacent development. There is existing five foot wide attached sidewalk along Lazasso Avenue, which the applicant proposes to maintain. The planning team is supportive of this proposal as the construction of detached sidewalk in this location has potential to conflict with Five Mile Creek near the northern boundary of the site. The applicant requests a waiver from the subdivision requirement to provide attached sidewalk on both sides of a private street serving more than 10 lots. However, as shown on this slide, the applicant does propose to provide pedestrian circulation throughout the development with a mix of sidewalks, pathways, and crosswalks. Therefore, the planning team is supportive of the request. In conclusion, the planning team recommends approval and I'll stand for any questions from the commission. Okay, thank you, Sabrina. We're gonna hear from the applicant next. Man, you're up first tonight, Ben. Well done. I got lucky today, <laughs> I guess. Is this on? You hear me? So. All right. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, Ben Semple with Rodney Evans and Partners, 1450 West Bannock Street, Boise 83702. Um, first, I want to thank Sabrina and the rest of the staff for helping work through this. It's We had some back and forth during the process of review for this project to, to get where we are today. Um, and I think we made a lot of good uh, changes to the project, bringing in some more amenities and, and really highlighting that pedestrian connectivity. Um, we are also in agreement with the 
staff report, the conditions of approval, and agency comments and conditions, including ACHD, floodplain, um, all of the comments that have been issued so far. And um, I don't have a whole lot to add. You know, the there's a project just west of here that's multifamily. This is fee simple, single family townhomes. So they will be individual lots platted um, so they can be sold. Uh, we really feel good about the treatment that we've done along not only Five Mile Creek, but Overland um, to provide some really enhanced landscaping and some buffering there. So I would stand for any questions that you might have. Okay. Uh, sit down on questions for one minute, Ben. We're okay. going to check in with Neighborhood Association first. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and do we have anybody from the Southwest Ada County Neighborhood? Is it this Alliance? Southwest Ada County Alliance? Right? Neighborhood Association? I can't remember. I don't think we do. No one's with us from the Neighborhood Association there? Staff? Okay. I will stop rambling and then move on to questions by the commission for staff or the applicant. Chairman, mm -hmm. I do have a question for the applicant. Okay. Um, good evening, Ben. So your application speaks to attainably priced housing options, mm -hmm. but you don't define or provide an explanation as to what you mean by attainably priced housing options. I was just wondering, um, I didn't see an estimated price point for the townhouse units. So I was just wondering if you could provide some clarification. Sure, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Seha. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, my clients, they develop multifamily and single family product. And so what they do when it, for affordability, what they try to do is keep amenities for the community that they build in so that they don't have to put a lot of high value or high cost finishes and amenities in the individual units themselves. They're two bedroom, two bathroom units, so they tend to be a little bit more affordably priced. Um, the price point on those is gonna be driven by the market, um, but given that they're 1,500 to 1,700 square feet, just kind of lends itself to more affordability than what could be built, that you, know, you could have 3,000 square foot homes that cost more. So um, there wasn't any requirement for affordability. Um, just based on the client that I have and knowing what they build, they've been rehabbing existing apartment units and they try to keep the rents lower. I think when I talked to them on this one, they were looking at, I'm going to say that probably between 350 and 400 for units like this. So um, kind of at the lower end of the market right now. Um, but not necessarily based on like AMI or any calculations that are used for new code projects. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Daly. I've got a couple quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, first, this pathway, the, the uh, pathway on the back side of the project, it's shown in the, um, presentation as public, but it's also shown as four feet in width. So my question is, what's the linear distance of that path? Uh, Mr. Chair uh, and Commissioner Danley, that is something that I don't know off the top of my head. Um, it is shown as public. We are requested by the Neighborhood Association to provide a pathway along the north side here along Five Mile Creek. Um, this is similar to a condition for the project of the West. Mm -hmm. And because that exists in not only floodplain, but floodway in some areas, um, the developer was told they could use a natural surface, a little bit narrower. Um, you know, they're looking at gravel. I, it connects, it will connect to another pathway that leads back out to the Overland frontage on there. I'm going to guess looking at that. Yeah, that's the pathway as it would be for both projects connected. I'm going to say that's probably about 200, and 200 feet maybe long. So you hit the number on the head for ADA. <laughs> 200? So it needs to be um, a five-foot section every couple hundred feet for passing. Okay. So my question is for wheelchair access in particular, I'm curious, can you make that five? Um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Danley, I'm sure we can find some areas that we can widen it to five feet to allow for passing. Okay. We do have some bench areas along that too. So I think that would probably lend itself to the area to widen it out because those fall not in the floodway. So we can do some more built and hard surface type stuff. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman, my other question mm -hmm. is, so Ben, this is really interesting in that we have a whole slew of units that face a uh, principal arterial with probably 30,000 plus vehicles a day. And, you know, we all see every now and then once in a while, unfortunately, a driver who careens into the front of a building. And so I'm really interested in that subject because this is not a top, a typical design that we would see on a principal arterial type of a road. But what I also see is a significant number of trees that are, are there. And I'm guessing that's your general approach to try to provide safety. I'm just wondering if you can kind of talk about that orientation and any general concerns or what you're doing to mitigate that, that at all. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Danley, um, you know, part of what we did was to enhance that landscape buffer along Overland. It was kind of twofold. Um, we needed to provide a 30 foot landscape buffer there. And so with alternative compliance, we increased the number of trees there to really get a dense uh, buffer. We also had some conversations during the neighborhood meeting with some neighbors across Overland that they wanted to see some additional buffering there. Mm -hmm. um, and really, you know, with the active space kind of on the west end of this project, there's not a whole lot of usable yard space, I would say, between those units and Overland. So between street trees that are in a planter strip between the road and the detached sidewalk, and then that additional buffer, we're really looking to create I don't know, more of a microclimate, I guess, for the fronts of those that face Overland, because it is a little <laughs> challenging. Um, but we also, with the land use that's applied here, um, we couldn't do anything denser than a single family project. So um, this was the direction that the developer wanted to go. Um, we feel good about it. I think that with, I think it's 48 feet about from the curb line to the face of those buildings. So hopefully enough space to stop if a car comes through there. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We've got Commissioner Mooney has his hand up. So I'm going to go online to John next. Thanks, Mr. Chair. A question for a staff um, in this alternative compliance and where we just were uh, with Commissioner Danley on the front front there, the 30 foot. Um, on, on our agenda packet, page 100, I, I'm confused a, a little bit, and I guess it's just just for my education. Um, what's the intended purpose of the landscape requirement in that 30 foot buffer? Kind of to Commissioner Danley's question. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, generally the intent of that landscape buffer is to ensure that there is adequate separation between you know larger arterial and collector streets and the residential units, um, you know, typically we do anticipate to see tree plantings there to help provide some visual buffer and some sound mitigation as well. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chair. I got to follow up with that for uh, mm -hmm. Sabrina. So, uh, so having said that, um, there was a comment in our packet there, and it said that that standard buffer requirement is not compatible with the nature of the proposed townhome development. That kind of confused me. Could you talk me through that comment in our packet? Mr. Chair, Commissioners, um, you know, I think with the intent of this landscape design, those units fronting Overland do all have individual walkways that connect the front entrances of the units to the multi-use pathway along Overland Road. Um, so to just improve pedestrian movement through that area, we felt that the 30 feet separation between the front of the townhomes and the back of the multi-use path instead of a separation of 30 feet between at the front of the townhomes and the property line was adequate. Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Moore. So I have a question for maybe staff and then maybe um, applicant too. So does this project go to design review next? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, yes, it will. Um, and Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. just mainly because We've got a 10 foot multi-use path and then kind of a first level that's just garage with no real kind of living space activation. And I know there's a note on the elevations on our packet page 33 about uh, garages from units will provide access on the north side of buildings and additional windows we provided on the south elevation for the first floor. Because um, right now I'm looking at a, I think it's C1 on that sheet. 
that doesn't have a lot of windows on it. And so I don't know, you know, what is the city's policy for, you know, activation on the first floor, especially if you've got, you know, that 10 foot multi-use pathway along Overland? Yeah, Mr. Chair, commissioners, we do expect to have front doors that face, you know, towards that multi-use path so that there is a way for pedestrians to directly leave those units and walk to that pathway. Um, you know, through the design review application, the fenestration and modulation of those front elevations facing towards Overland will be reviewed in more detail as well. Yeah, please. Uh, and so there's no there's no requirement for like a living space on the first floor or anything like that um, in this particular zone. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Moore, not in the R1C zone for this product type. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and open up this item for public testimony. <clears throat> I had uh, we have one person on the sign up, Maria Bronson, president. Come on up, please. Podium is free here. Um, after Miss Bronson, if anybody else needs to testify here in person, come on up to the podium. Um, everyone will have three minutes to testify, and if you can start with start with your name and address. I'm a little short. Hi, you're Kelly. fine. You're good. I have a question. If the graduated lot law that is on the books for that area has been taken into account this both phases of this development but right up against half acre lots um the development on the other side of lazaso they reduced that by 56 houses because of that factor also five mile creek is a protected wetland they made a lot allowances for that across the street I talked to the planner and she said that she believed there was allowances made for that. There are nesting wildlife in there. Okay. I just want to know if Mr. Evans has considered less housing in the area, maybe 16, 20 units instead of 28. That's 56 cars coming out onto Lazaso. They had to move the school bus stop because it was rear-ended off of Overland twice last year. Anybody pulling in there is going to want to turn left right into that. It's a car length and a half from the stop sign, the entrance to it. Anybody pulling in there is going to want to turn left in there. It's going to back traffic up onto Overland. If any of you guys live in that area and, you know, by Overland and Cloverdale, that is a disaster from 5 to 630 every night. I mean, it's not just the freeway. People are taking city streets home. And it really, it's a mess. You can't even get out of there. I've tried. I've had to turn around and go out the back way of the subdivision because the traffic is so busy. I am i don't know how many people we want to kill to allow them to have that high density. But if they cut it down just to 16 or 20, we you could cut 25, 30 cars from pulling in and out of there twice a day you know, during commute times, and on the weekends, probably eight or 10 times a day. Some of those people are gonna have teenagers. They're gonna be driving out, you know, out that too. So you have to, I'm just saying from 28 places, that's gonna be 56 cars additional every day. I know the people that are line up on the other side to Overland, there's only eight houses and they have a difficult time getting out and turning left to get getting out of their little street to get onto Lazaso to get out onto Overland. Sometimes the, the cars are backed all the way up. So, I mean, I know you want to get as much bang for your buck dollar wise, but the people who have bought large lots should be considered and not have this kind of density housing butted up against them. That's the reason we bought our lots. And I've lived in that area for 40 years. So, this area that they have slated that's right off of Lazasa was slated to be developed about 10 years ago and they decided not to do it. So I, I just would like to see less housing, less density in there just because I don't want to get killed. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bronson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, did we get address? Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Bronson. I'm sorry. If you could just step back to the mic and give us your name and address. I know you signed up here, but we got to do it for the folks at home. Maria Bronson. And address, please. Thank you. Address, please. 
Sorry. You're fine. <laughs> Excuse me. Just your address. None your address. 11658 West Florida Drive. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. Okay. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Hi. Uh, is there anybody else in person that would like to testify on this item? Okay. No takers. And then we will check in with anybody online. If you'd like to testify, please raise your hand. Okay. A couple hands up, staff. Kathy Ford, you're up first. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Ford. I live on 1328 South Lozazo. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hello. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm I'm also here to just express my concerns with the traffic and the, the new pattern with the high density housing that's going in at this particular project. Um, I would like to, you know, ask if, uh, I mean, I don't, haven't heard all of the different repetitions of what they have allowed and what they looked at as far as the density, but it's, it's adjacent to the other um, property that was um, already approved for apartments. And the traffic on Overland is atrocious. It, it already, uh, you know, earlier speaking that there was 30,000 plus vehicles on that arterial already. And Lozazo Road or Avenue wasn't even built for that to handle that many people coming out of those side streets. That's going to congest that part of Lozazo as well as prop people trying to turn on to Overland. So part of my testimony at this point was to ask some questions if you know anybody's considering the safety of these vehicles and pedestrians in this area that are utilizing overland with these high density housings the other concern i had was well there's several but um one is on the east east side of Lazazo lots, those family units are only two story and they have limited or lower amounts of vehicles for those dwellings. And it seems more appropriate if you're gonna e expand the other side of Lazazo on the west side of Lazazo, that it would be in compliant with those types of buildings and, and vehicle garages. But I, I'm looking at what's already been approved on the west end of this project. Um, I don't have the name of that particular um, um, project that's been approved for the apartments that are four story and up to 166 parking spaces. But it seems like if all of those people are trying to travel out of their apartments and their townhomes to go on to Lazazo or, or Overland, it's gonna create a lot of traffic issues and safety concerns. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Appreciate it. And okay, staff, who do we have next? I see a few hands online. Jesse Nilo. Okay. Hello. Hi there. Hi. I'm Jesse Nilo. I'm at 11986 West La Pan Drive, right um, near Lazaso. And my my concern is the um the, the traffic as well. I've I've seen that fence at the corner of Lazaso and Overland um uh, broken several times the in the 23 years that I've lived here. Um so it seems that somebody runs into that fence every few years and they had to have they've had to repair it right where this this proposal is going in. Um, so I'm concerned about the the road. There's no light system there. There's no traffic lights. There's just one stop sign. And I've seen a lot of accidents. I saw a motorcyclist um, um, at, at this intersection be hit by a car um, not too long ago. And uh, my um, my daughter and, and her boyfriend were hit, rear-ended at, uh, rear, at this intersection 
coming off of Overland Road, slowing down to turn right onto Lozazo and somebody rear-ended him. It's just kind of a small, unexpected little street. So if you want to put that many houses in here, I think that's a terrible idea. And that's all I wanted to say. I would like to see a lot less houses go in. And I think to cram it with that many proposed houses would be um, pretty disastrous. This The street turning in would um, be too sudden. Lozazo itself is already too sudden off of Overland Road as far as fast as people drive on Overland. Um, and then the... Uh, the proposed private street into this new subdivision proposal would be very, very quick. Um, just a couple of car lengths and then they'd be turning left already into it. Um, I, I walk my dogs every day in this whole neighborhood and it's, um, um, yeah, it's just too dense of a project for, for the, uh, proposal. I believe too many houses. So thank you for hearing me. Okay. All right. And thank you. All right. And staff looks like we have um, Phil Howard up next online. Okay. Hi, this is actually um, Heather Howard. Hi, Heather. I live at 1525 South Lozazo Avenue. So we are the house closest to the project. Okay. I just, um, think that our concern is traffic as well. In the time that we've lived here, we've seen several fatalities between our house and Cloverdale. And the other concern is that our, um, for the apartments, is that pathway going, is, are they going to be able to drive through there, through this new neighborhood onto Lozazo? That's what we were told initially is that people pulling out of the apartments would only be able to go right onto Lozazo, or excuse me, Overland. If you wanted to go left onto Overland, you had to come down and hit Lozazo. So that is a huge concern if if that's going to be the traffic pattern. And that's all that we had to say. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Okay, Steph, I think that does it for everybody online, it looks like. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the public testimony and bring the applicant back for rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Again, Ben Semple with Rodney Evans and Partners, 1450 West Bannock. Um, yeah, so just to go through some of these things, um, you know, basically the entire site as staff brought up is in a floodplain area, doesn't preclude development. Um, we are remaining completely out of the floodway. Uh, we don't have any lots other than common lots that overlay that area. And we will be establishing along the north side of all of the or of the property a riparian area that's an easement that nothing other than native vegetation and you, know, you can't put down any uh, chemicals or anything like that. So other than the kind of natural pathway that that goes along there, there won't be any uh, anything that's disturbing the any wetland which we haven't seen any wetlands mapped on the site itself we do see the floodplain and floodway um and then we're enhancing that riparian area with a lot of native trees native uh plant material to help encourage additional wildlife to be there um regarding the entry location so the entry off of lazasso is in alignment with a street that's on the east side of lazasso um, that's required by ACHD as the entry point. It's about as far north as we could put it um, because of that alignment. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the distance, but I th think it's probably 80 to 100 feet from the entry to the to the intersection with Overland. Um, so I think that that should give, I mean, that's typically enough stacking for people to get in and turn and, and turn in there. Um, I understand, you know, traffic is an issue. There's a bus route here. There's bike lanes here. Lazasso is a low stress bikeway in the master pathways plan and bikeways plan. So um, the intent would be that these types of developments allow for people to use alternatives to single passenger cars to drive everywhere. Um, this is a little over a half, half a mile from a, I think it's a community activity center at five mile and Overland. So there are a lot of opportunities for going to out to eat or going to Fred Meyer. I think Albertsons is down there as well. Um, 
Additionally, these are two bed, two bath units. So with two car garages, all of them have two car garages. Um, and then we have 14 to 15 additional surface parking spaces on this site. So more than what would be required for single family in the old code, way more than what would be required in single family in the new code. Um, the proximity to the larger lots, I mean, we've got Five Mile Creek there that kind of splits this. The other property to the west was commercially uh, not zoned, but a land use. So um, a single family residential use is a much lower intensity than what potentially could be done with a comp plan change or getting any sort of commercial um, or even multifamily on this site. Um, regarding the cross connection, that is a condition of approval is that this project provides cross connectivity to the apartment project that's to the west. Uh, my understanding, um, having been on the apartment project to the west, that entrance on Overland is full access. It's left, right, turn in from going west or east on Overland, turn out left. Um, and then this project would connect to Lazaso. So there will be an opportunity for cars to go out onto Overland directly or onto Lazaso, um, depending on what traffic is dictating at that point. Um, some of the safety concerns that are brought up are not lost on the developer during the neighborhood. Um, meeting as well as the hearing on the other project. Uh, we talked with the Neighborhood Association. They're really working on ACHD to try to get at least a ped crossing at Lazasso, especially because it is a low stress bikeway crossing. And so the developer of this project had indicated to them that they'd like to participate in those conversations with ACHD and provide support. They can't afford to build a Hawk Flasher themselves right there just for a single project, but they would definitely be behind getting some sort of safety improvements at that intersection. Um, it's too close to the Cloverdale intersection to have a full traffic light, but some sort of pedestrian crossing. Um, yeah, we've kind of talked about that as being, you know, participating in those conversations. Um, you know, and again, traffic wherever you go um, is an issue. You know, if we can get people living closer to employment and services and stuff, then they have an opportunity at least to walk, bike, take a bus. Um, so they're not driving and uh, you know we've we've designed the project to to comply with the standards of code for all the parking and uh, you know really think it's a high quality project to come into the neighborhood here i'd stand for any additional questions okay i think we're all set there ben yep. no questions thank you okay thank you okay all right we'll go ahead and bring these items back before the commission um you know again we're dealing with a rezone, a conditional use permit, and the plat. So we can take those items all up individually. We can take them all up as a whole. It's kind of up to the commission's discretion. So just wanted to make that point, though. And then a little reminder as well that we are recommending to council um, on the rezone and on the preliminary plat. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Moore. I think I'll take them all up the same time um, okay so i move that we recommend approval of car 23-24 and suv 23-60 and approve pud 23-36 with all the terms and conditions in the staff report second okay great thank you uh commissioner moore we have a motion to approve and recommend approval uh, by commissioner moore and then the second was by commissioner danley uh, Jennifer, would you like to start with some discussion? Sure. Thank you. So I think, you know, I agree with the the staff report and in, in, in its entirety, honestly. And I think generally I like, I think it's encouraging to see that, you know, the city is working on these alternative compliance methods and some of these more difficult parcels being in the flood zone like this parcel is it's going to be challenging to develop and seeing some alternative compliance so that this parcel can actually develop is, is really great. Um, in terms of the concerns, I think, you know, adjacent to large lots, there's a very large kind of easement, I guess, a very large riparian area and natural area that separates those large lots from this particular lot. Um, I don't remember the actual number of it, but or the actual dimension of it, but it, it is quite large. It's not directly adjacent to that, those lots backing, backing up to it. There's significant vegetation and, and general just distance from that, from that, those lots to the north. I 
think for, you know, traffic and, and high density, specifically for the density, you know, these are adjacent to R1B zones. Um, and this is just a rezone to an R1C. It is taking advantage of a dis density bonus because of its proximity to the, um, what is it, to the... What is to it? the, the uh, neighborhood yeah, the... node. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's taking a, a advantage of a density bonus there where it's a little bit higher density than it normally would have been. Um, but two and a half acres for 12 units per acre as opposed to eight units per acre doesn't, I mean, it nets a handful more units, but it, it's not terribly, terribly significant. Um, and being so close to that, trans to that kind of neighborhood node, it makes sense to have a higher density right there. That's where we cluster a higher density because that's where it's walkable. And, and then in reference to the two-story um, units across the street, I think, you know, when we're talking about adjacencies, having something that's three-story directly across from two-story is, is what really makes sense. Because if you think about it, even in terms of the project next door, if that does get built as well, you have two story, then you've got three story, then you've got four story, and we're kind of moving up as we go towards that intersection. And so that's kind of where this volume makes sense. That's where the density makes sense is you're kind of grading up to that, up to that more dense area as you go towards that intersection of Cloverdale. And so for all those reasons, and including those stayed in the staff report, I'm in support of the project. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Moore. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Daly. So first, with respect to the rezone, and, and much of my support is is echoed by Commissioner Moore, but with the, re the rezone, given that this is subject on the future land uh, land use map um, as the type of, of future uh, residential that it is, this complies, so I have no issue with respect to the rezone um, at all. With respect to the conditional use permit and preliminary plat, I think that what we have here, first of all, is arterial frontage. And if we can't build higher density housing on an arterial, where can we build it? That's a, it's a good opportunity to make that happen. That's exactly where we should be putting these types of projects. Secondly, this is a for purchase product. We've been pro, pro, uh, approving a number of, of multifamily and mostly apartment types of housing for the last year. We haven't seen a lot of for purchase. The market needs that. And I am happy to see that this particular uh, application addresses that. Um, with respect to the rest of it, I think was what Commissioner Moore said, transit, this is the whole point of the code, is that we're trying to get more density near transit stops so that our transit gets bolstered and that we provide um, housing that, that is indicative of transit-oriented types of development. That's what we're trying to get. That's what the code permits. That's what this is applied for and is, is receiving in this, in this instance. Um, with respect to Overland, I think one of the things that was discussed in our work session, frankly, is critical in this decision, this discussion tonight. One of the things that the ACHD staff member mentioned in the work session was that the design speed for arterials is to be 25 or 30 miles per hour. That is a major shift in their policy. That means that the roadway is to actually not just function, but be designed to ha have that traffic speed, which addresses the very concerns that we heard from many of the folks this evening. I'm going to use a term, but Overland is a, it's a traffic sewer. It just is. It's not a good design. It's just a freeway, basically. And I think the district recognizes it and, rec and is trying to make changes to that. So the flaw is, frankly, in the roadway design. But when we look at our staff report, from ACHD, it says the applicant's proposal exceed district policy and should be approved. It says that multiple times. So that's their opinion and it's their system. So I'm going to agree with them in this particular instance. I think this is a pretty good project. I love the fact that it's so heavily landscaped. I think that makes a big difference and it stands out. And, and ultimately, I think this project should be approved. Good. Thank you, Commissioner Danley. Any other discussion or comments? Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Well, uh, Commissioners Moore and Danley sort of stole all of my comments as well. Um, I think the project uh, is a nice fit uh, for the site, and I don't have a problem with the rezone. 
um, as Commissioner Moore discussed, you know, we're within the neighborhood activity centers. Um, and I think that's the idea, right, is to get that density along those arterial roadways, like Commissioner Danley mentioned. So um, in addition to that, you know, I feel like that just looking at the site plan, uh, that they've done a nice job, you know, arranging the units and you know, thoughtful approach to the road frontages, um, the parking checks all the boxes as well. So um, no issue there as far as the density and the site layout is concerned. Certainly understand the the neighborhood concerns about traffic, and I um, certainly agree with Commissioner Danley's thoughts on the roadway, and, and we had some positive um, comments from ACHD before our meeting started tonight. So I think that there's actually a lot of things happening that will hopefully improve some of the traffic concerns on Overland moving forward. So, um, yeah, so I'll be supporting the motion as well. And unless there are any other comments, any last minute comments, I'll go ahead and call the roll here. Okay, again, we have a we have motions to recommend approval of CAR 2324 and SUB 2360 and a motion to approve PUD 23-36. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Schaefer. Yes. Danley. Yes. Moore. Yes. Mooney. Yes. Seha. Yes. Porras. Yes. Doan. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Up next is item number two, CVA 23-28 Ethos Design and Remodel LLC. This item was deferred from our February 12th meeting. Address is 5115 West Ponder Street. This is a variance to encroach the side setback on 0.22 acres in an R1C zone. Again, this is a legacy code item, and we're going to hear from Sabrina with staff again. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the item before you is a request for a variance to encroach into the side setback on 0.22 acres located at 5115 Ponder Street in an R1C zone. The subject property is located on Ponder Street between Orchard Street and Philippi Street. It contains an existing single family home, which was constructed in 1948, a detached ADU located to the east of the home and a detached garage located behind the western portion of the home. The detached garage was constructed with a setback of approximately three feet and eight inches from the eastern side property line where the R1C zone would require a setback of five feet. The applicant proposes to construct two additions onto the existing detached garage. The first would be a carport on the northern side of the garage, which would provide additional covered parking and allow for sheltered access between the garage and the primary home. The second would be a second story addition above the existing garage, which would contain additional living space associated with the primary home. The applicant requests a variance to allow both additions to match the current encroachment of the existing garage. The applicant's letter of intent indicates that the proposed design will allow for reuse of existing garage slab and footings, thereby reducing the cost of the project. Additionally, the proposed design would limit second story windows facing the adjacent property to the west in order to protect the privacy of the adjacent neighbor. However, the planning team finds that there is no hardship or exceptional circumstance which would justify the variance request. There are no topographic constraints or natural features present on the site, which would preclude the construction of additional parking or living space outside of the required setbacks. Additionally, the existing driveway and garage provide more off-street parking than is required by the development code. Therefore, the proposed carport is not necessary for the property to comply with the parking requirements of the code. As detailed in your packets and summarized on this slide, there are also multiple alternatives, which would allow the applicant to construct additional living space on the site while complying with the setback requirements of the zone. Two of these alternatives would allow the existing garage structure to remain in its current location. In conclusion, the planning team recommends denial, and in order to obtain approval, the planning team recommends that the applicant pursue an alternative design, such as those outlined in the project report in accordance with the requirement of code. And I'll stand for any questions. Okay, thank you, Sabrina. Next, we'll hear from the applicant. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I'm Anna Marie Collins with Ethos Design Remodel, address 2999 West Moore Street, Boise, Idaho. Okay. Um, as stated, first, I would like to thank the Planning and Zoning Commission. Thanks, Sabrina, for working with us on this. 
um, it's always helpful getting to learn this process and do more of these projects and come to these hearings. Uh, as stated in the P&Z report for our proposal, uh, our proposal is to expand the existing detached garage and would allow for the conservation of embedded energy and reuse of building materials as encouraged by policy ES 9.5. It also stated that granting of the variance would not be materially detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare, or injurious to the property or improvements of other property owners. We'd also like to highlight we have no objections from the neighborhood and have full support of our surrounding neighbors that would be directly affected by the proposed construction of this project. Um, regarding the carport in the commission's report, it's mentioned that the carport cannot be constructed in compliance with the required five foot setback as the support post of the carport structure would be located in front of the door to the existing garage, blocking vehicular access. However, the existing driveway and detached one car garage provide the two off street parking spaces which are required. Uh, therefore, the proposed carport addition is not necessary for the site to meet the off street parking requirements of the development code. Um, our proposed carport would not block access as mentioned in the project report, as the garage door would remain relatively in the same place it is now. It's a single door and it's offset, just like um, the current position. So it would continue to maintain a straight drive from the driveway into the garage for parking and allow just enough room for one vehicle to get into the garage and kind of turn themselves and park centered within the structure. Uh, our original intent with the carport is to provide additional covered parking space while maintaining room in the garage to park a vehicle or to also add flexibility to the structure um, so that during inclement weather, we would still have a covered parking space, which would also allow the garage to be utilized as a workshop space or uh, remain flexible for anything else needed by the main home. Uh, our intent with this variance overall is not only to maintain open yard space, but to also preserve as much of the existing structure as possible. Uh, if we were to have to apply as a non-conforming structure to maintain the footprint of the existing garage, we would still be required to build the second story within current setbacks, which would create two major issues for us. It would encroach on the proposed square footage of the second story, but it would also require additional rework of the, of the existing structure further than what would be required to add a full width. Um, our preliminary engineering consultations have shown that we would need to potentially add a support post inside of the garage, which would interfere with pulling the car into the garage um, for that offset cantilevered style second story, which was listed as alternative four in the planning and zoning report. Um, the support post would encroach on the interior parking space and make it difficult to open passenger side doors on the vehicle once parked inside. Um, other alternatives for the offset second story would also prove more costly to our client, which would require additional modifications to the structure that we're hoping to preserve. With our current proposal, we hope to maintain the existing standard that's not imposing or wanting to change the current character of the neighborhood and requiring the remodeled garage to be shifted over to meet current setbacks imposes a standard that was not intended for the neighborhood when it was built and is still currently maintained without hardships or safety issues since it was established over 75 years ago as the homes were built in 48. And we believe the garage was either built at the same time as the home or built in 1949 based on the historic um, view from Ada County software um, aerial photos. Thank you for your time and let me know if I can answer any questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, first, we'll check in before we do questions. We'll check in if anyone from the Central Bench Neighborhood Association is present. No, it doesn't look like it. Nobody online anyway. Okay. All right. So we will go ahead and move into questions by the commission for either the staff or the applicant. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Moore. All right. So um, I think this is a question for the applicant. So on our packet page, I think it's once. Oh, gosh, I had it. Anyways, on in your kind of narrative description of the project, um, there's one line that says that the garage is in need of a repair. And then, but the whole project is kind of based on adding a second level to it. Um, and reusing the foundations. Have you verified that the foundations can actually be reused even with the garage needing repair? Yes, we have. We've had preliminary engineering consultations. Okay. And then um, one more question. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. So in the existing building, you know, it's a gabled roof, single level. This proposed building is a shed roof um, over the whole building. So that's twice the drainage that would be going towards the neighbor's side. Are you planning on a, a, a gutter and downspout on that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Daly. So to the applicant, I mean, our job is to determine if there's a hardship. Financial considerations are not allowed. We're not allowed to consider financial hardship. So it sounds like there's a little bit of a misunderstanding and in terms of between staff and yourselves. But I, I need you to be real clear here. What do you believe is the hardship for us to make a decision on this? Um. If we're setting aside financial, I would like to point out there's a structure in the center of the yard, which is concreted in. It's a large pergola with footings. And so if we were to go with some of the alternative um, alternatives that were presented by planning and zoning, um, it would require demolition of that. And we would like to preserve the existing structures as much as possible, um, as outlined in policy ES 9.5. And so this look, keeping the garage for the most part in the existing location um, would allow us to do that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. John, did you have anything? You're good, okay. Yeah, no, thanks Mr. Chair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and Sabrina, just to confirm, you know, we're talking about a, a we're at a foot and a half into the setback. Is that correct? You know, five foot setback. We're about a foot and a half into it. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, roughly. Okay, right. Thank you. Okay. No other questions. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. We'll go ahead and move on to public testimony. We did have a few folks sign up at a time on this one. Uh, I have Anne Marie, well, Anne Marie Collins, and then uh, Gigi Larson. If you could start with your name and address, please, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Chairman, Commissioner. My name is Gigi Larson. My address is 5221 West Ponder Street in Boise. My husband and I are in support of 5115 West Potter Street, requesting for variance to enroach the side setback on 0 0.22 acres. I have, I love having good neighbors. This resident has been, has lived on Ponder Street for about 16 years. I would like to see her continue making her property fit for her. Let's retain good neighbors. As the planning division report, project report stated in quotes, the proposed carport can't be constructed in compliance with the required five foot side setback as a support post of a carport structure would be located in front of the door of the existing garage, blocking vehicle access to the existing garage, end quote. The applicant is requesting a garage and carport to be positioned in a standard location to the location and position of the house and is in alignment with the property. The request is acceptable to the street's community standard. I appreciate homeowners wanting to modify and continue their residence on our street. This reduces homeowner turnover. Let's support homeowners improving and maintaining their property. The properties on our street and neighborhood are over 75 years old. Most of the houses on our street and the neighborhood have their garage less than today's current code. I did an eyeball count and 43% of the houses are in current code compliance. Therefore, half are not, and it's acceptable and within the current community standards for our neighborhood. Additionally, there are, are no imposed hardship on maintaining this current community standard in our neighborhood. As mentioned in the planning division project report section 8.2, granting the variance will not be in conflict with the comprehension plan and will not affect a change in the zoning. The current proposal is in support by certain policies within the plan. With the addition of the proposed carport and second story living space, the garage will 
not detract from the existing character of the property street presence, unquote. As mentioned in Planning Division Project Report Section 8.3, the planning team cannot identify any adverse impacts on sur surrounding properties. Please allow this remodel to continue as it's within current existing neighborhood standard. Help us retain our good neighbors and the neighborhood character. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that would like to testify on this item? Okay, very good. And we'll go ahead and check with folks online. If you're online and would like to testify on this item, please raise your hand. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and close up public testimony. Um, bring back the applicant for rebuttal. Um, I don't think I have anything to say. I think we're good. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Okay, we'll go ahead then and bring this item back before the commission to render a decision. Again, this is item number two, CVA 23-28. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Mooney, please. Uh, I move that we uh, deny CVA 23-00028 and due to the, the rationale, the analysis from the project report and with all the conditions in the project report. Okay. Thank you, John. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. I have a second by Commissioner Seha. John, would you like to start some discussion? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, mm -hmm. great uh, testimony from uh, the applicant's neighbor. And, uh, but as Commissioner Danley made clear in our in the question and answer, um, the community standards in the fact that half of the existing homeowners are not in compliance with uh, the code is really not something that we can uh, consider. The, the code's real clear. We have to find a hardship and, and uh, as the staff report makes clear, they're isn't a hardship other than a financial one that that I can see. So for that reason, I'm I I don't think this is a worth an approval and it should be denied. Okay, great. Thank you, John. And I I would echo um, John's comment on that. I mm -hmm. mean, we've had at least one other, well maybe two, um, other proposals come before us in the last couple of months where um, we really can't grant that variance because of the financial piece. So. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Seha. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or discussion? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Daly. Uh, I reluctantly am supporting the motion. I'm not a fan of these because this is a historic property that was, for a lack of a better term, born before the legacy code was born. And we applied mm -hmm. sort of a one size fit all code to this lot and many, many others and instantly, you know, sort of made things different. However, in previous instances where we've had applications for variance requests, we've had structures that were already in the setback after the the code was enacted this one we don't have that so we're trying to put something in that doesn't exist already and is not already subject to something that instantly made it non-compliant the hardship that i'm asked that i was trying to get at you know with regard to the demolition i don't think that quite i don't think that gets us to where we need it to be i'm with you we need housing we need another unit we would, you know, it makes all the sense in the world um, for what you're trying to do. But the problem is, is that it's that proverbial, you know, if we let one in, do we continue to go down that slope? And in rare instances where we have allowed a variance, there are quite extenuating circumstances that I don't see this one meeting. So reluctantly, I, I need to support uh, the motion that's in front of us. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, Commissioner Doan, yeah. Um, I just want to echo uh, Commissioner Danley's um, mm -hmm. comments there. 
I feel the same way. So great. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yeah, please, Jennifer. I think the the biggest kind of I love reusing buildings whenever we can. Uh, the least amount of building material that we can put into the landfill and the waste stream, the better. I think the problem that I have with this particular application, and I love the ES, the whole chapter, it's great. Uh, I think the the problem with this particular application that I have is that you know the non-compliant structure is single story, and the proposal is for two story structure, and so you're increasing your compliance, your non-compliance vertically, which is very impactful to the neighbor and shadows and and all that good stuff. Um, and so that's really the reason for my hesitance. And, you know, if you could make that set back into the five feet on the second level, um, maybe with some creative placement of post work, that would be great. Um, I think because that's an option um, and just because that increases that non-compliance, I'm, I'm in support of the motion. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay. Yeah. I think like, I honestly, I mean, I've been up here for a number of years now and we are reading the commission, I think we were all in agreement that we're probably heading towards a reluctant denial. Um, these are always tough, you know. Um, and I think, and I'll be supporting the motion for all the reasons stated by my fellow commissioners. Um, and I think for me, a lot of times, you know, yeah, the financial hardship really doesn't apply in, in this. We can't ever use that, right, as a, as a reason. Uh, you know, we need another more substantial, you know, physical hardship, right, uh, topography, you know, something along those lines. Um, and then I always tend to default to, you know, I appreciate that the neighbors are in support of this project, but these decisions that we make up here are will last for decades, right? Beyond the current homeowners, right? The neighbors, the current neighbors, the current homeowner. And so I tend to always uh, think of it that way too, is that code's telling us here's the requirements and that these are decisions that are going to affect people you know, down the line, right? So I, I totally agree with Commissioner Moore's statement that, you know, we have a single, we have an existing single story structure, but now we're making a two story structure, which has a bigger impact on the neighboring property. So I tend to think about the next homeowner and the next neighbor, right? And the next neighbor after that, right? Um, and on the timeline and how that could impact, you know, the future occupants of these dwellings. So that's where, um, at least my head always goes in these discussions, right? Um, beyond just the, nuts and bolts of the code itself. So um, yeah, I hope that you're able to move forward with some semblance of the existing structure and you can make it work financially. But um, I think the way things are trending right now, I'll call the vote, but um, it sounds like a reluctant denial here from the commission. Okay, any other final thoughts? All right, well, clerk, please call the roll. Schaefer. Uh, yes. Danley. Aye. Moore. Yes. Mooney. Yes. Seha. Yes. Torres. Yes. Dong. Yes. All in favor? Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to check in and take the commission's polls here. Do you guys want to take a quick break? Or do you want to press on? We have one more item on the agenda. Press on, Let's say, press on. Go. Okay, we've got heads nodding. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and just uh, recuse myself now from this item. It's PUD 23-33. Um, as an employee of the land group, we handled the site plans for this application. So I will be recusing myself from this item and handing the reins over to Commissioner Danley. And I bet you're going to want to go home now. Too, <laughs> <aren't> <laughs> I think I might have approval from staff to sneak out of here tonight. We have enough folks here. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right. Okay. Uh, next up, item number three, PD 23 33. It's a conditional use permit located 3430 North Maple Grove Road. Mr. Dennis, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Danley. The item before you is a request for a conditional use permit for a planned unit development comprised of eight multifamily units located at 3430 North Maple Grove Road on 0 0.94 acres in an R1C single family residential zone. The applicant, Leap Housing, has proposed to create a new buildable parcel through a minor land division. 
This new parcel would be, would be a large flag lot that meets the dimensional standards of the R1C zone. The buildable area of the flag lot will be located in the northeast corner of the existing parcel behind the existing religious institution, which is planned to remain. The newly created lot will allow the applicant to develop affordable housing within this existing open space. The individuals and families which will be considered as potential tenants will be qualified under an 80% area median income guideline as laid out by the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Department. The subject property is surrounded by alternative modes of transportation, as seen on your screen. Due to its adjacency to Maple Grove Road, the site is eligible for a transit incentive density bonus, which would allow for an increased residential density of 12 units per acre, beyond the eight units per acre typically allowed by the R1C zone, which the applicant has chosen to utilize in order to allow for residential development of a, of a residential density of approximately 8.5 units per acre. The proposal meets all the dimensional standards of the development code as all setbacks and height requirements have been met. As conditioned, the site is large enough to accommodate the use as all yards, open spaces, pathways, parking, and landscaping requirements have been met. As detailed within the project report, the proposed development is supported by multiple goals, principles, policies within the comprehensive plan, including those related to the development of workforce housing, the promotion of increased usership of alternative, alternative transportation in order to reduce vehicle miles traveled, and the incorporation of compatible infill development with the surrounding area. Additionally, commenting agencies have confirmed that as conditioned, the development will not place an undue burden on any public facilities in the in the vicinity. The recommended conditions of approval are summarized on your screen. These include requirements for signs to be in, on, installed on the 13 required parking spaces that have been designated for the subject development. The pedestrian pathway shall provide a more direct path than what was originally proposed as shown in blue. And it shall also incorporate a change in materials and or coloring where it passes any dry aisles in the parking lot. The street facing facade of the two Western units shall contain 15% fenestration with front doors that face west towards Maple Grove Road in accordance with duplex standards. Perimeter landscaping, that is the width, minimum width of the setbacks is required, which would be five feet along the northern and southern property lines and 15 uh, feet along the eastern rear property line. Finally, eight bicycle parking spaces are required. Public comments were received during the review of this proposal. Four letters of support and one letter of opposition were received. These concerns are summarized on your screen. Late correspondence was also received, which included two additional letters of support and a memo from the applicant, which listed potential minor modifications to the, pro to the proposal that, if necessary, would be determined during the value engineering phase of the development. These modifications include the um, potentially converting the product type of one duplex unit into two detached single family units, altering the building elevations, adjusting the amount of bedrooms, and reducing the southern setback to five feet. As mentioned within the late correspondence memo, all of the potential modifications listed by the applicant would still be compliant with code and would constitute minor modifications, which would be reviewed through an administrative level conditional use permit modification. In conclusion, the planning team recommends approval, and I will stand for any questions. All right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next up, we'll hear from the applicant from uh, Leap Charities, John O'Donnell. Oh, and I see Mr. Bart. Who's it going to be? All of you. The whole team. All right. Uh, name and address, if you wouldn't mind to start uh, things off. Thanks. You bet. Uh, my name is uh, Bart Cochran. My address is 3401 North 39th Street, Boise, Idaho. Um, thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, we have just a couple of slides just to orient. Can I use it? Okay, uh, our, um, my name is Bart Cochran. I'm the CEO of an organization called Leap Housing. If you're not familiar with our organization, we're a local nonprofit located here in Boise that focuses on affordable and workforce housing, the creation of. And tonight we bring uh, you eight units of critically needed affordable and workforce housing for your approval. 
Um, this project is also a unique partnership, a private public partnership between King of Glory Lutheran Church, who had excess land and desired to create solutions to a great community need of creating housing. So we were able to link up uh, with that organization to make this possible. Um, the project's uh, transit-oriented pocket neighborhood um, was the inspiration behind the design. Um, a bit about our process, just a little bit of background. I'm going to try not to repeat uh, what Matt said, so just a little bit about our process. Um, as a housing trust, um, our objective is thinking through the lens of a very, very long-term owner or neighbor, and so we try to make sure that we do some upfront work uh, to uh, communicate with neighbors to make sure that what we design uh, is a good fit for the location and that we can be a good neighbor in that sense. So before we submit an application to the city, uh, we do canvassing, we go door to door uh, within the community, and then we hold a neighborhood meeting. Our canvassing took place on October uh, 23rd. Our neighborhood meeting took place on November 2nd. And then we then follow up afterwards um, with any potential concerns that are brought up. Um, and we do that before we submit the application so we have time to make modifications to the plan to make sure that we address concerns as they come up. So there was a handful of residents that we met with a few times, uh, twice uh, to be exact on uh, the 8th and the 29th of November. Um, it was a site walk um, and they were neighbors to the north. Um, and the north is, um, if this is a, anyways, the top of the screen as the north side where the um, houses essentially abut the households there. Um, the things that, that were brought up were privacy. As you can imagine, it's been a vacant space and now there's gonna be houses there. Um, and so there, one thing was related to privacy. They didn't want people looking into the backyards. So we modified the, the design of the building um, so that there would be no uh, window on the second floor um, on the north side. And actually on the south side, that works the same as well, but it's looking into the gardens. Um, and then we also, um, there's also for multifamily, we have this landscaping buffer around the edge, uh, but we also uh, included instead of a five foot setback, which is what would be allowed, we have 15 foot setbacks to make sure there's even more buffer. And then our landscape design folks went back through and added some additional trees um, to create even more of a buffer there. Um, so that's how we address the privacy issues. Um, we were also communicated about a, a couple of other concerns that they had. One was about drainage or water runoff. Um, we uh, explained that stormwater runoff is retained on site and that we would continue to communicate with them as those designs came together to make sure that there isn't water from the property that runs onto theirs. Um, that was just a communication piece. And then also there's a, 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 a cable line that runs along the north side, uh, like internet cable. Um, and it's just sort of laying on the ground. And I was some concern by the neighbors that maybe they would lose internet access. Um, and so we assured them that we would work with the utility to make sure that there's a permanent location um, for that utility. We don't know why or how it ended up on the ground like that, but uh, we'll make sure that people don't lose the internet. Um, so we addressed all those concerns. Um, and so um, from that, um, that's sort of how we came up with this design. There used to be another duplex on the other side of it. So there was one, two, three duplexes next to one another. We, based on feedback, we pulled that back one around and moved it to the other side so that we kind of balanced the two bits of um, housing and then to try to send, uh, open up the internal space to create more um, gathering space. You can see there's um, on the design, you can see there's some front porches. It's kind of designed around some of the pocket neighborhood styles to help folks kind of gather in the center spaces there. Um, so uh, simply with that, um, this project, we see sort of multiple outcomes uh, coming out of this. We see uh, this as responsive, community-centric type housing. Um, we think this is housing that meets all incomes, um, which I know is a, um, a key objective of the city. And we think this is a unique partnership that we hope will be a catalyst for other holders of um, underutilized land to create housing in our community. So with that, we request your approval of the King of Glory CUP application. Um, we've read over the um, conditions of approval and um, we have, uh, we agree with all of the recommended um, conditions um, there. 
So with that, I'll stand for any questions you may have. Okay. Is there anybody else from your team that you wanted to testify? Or are you good? No, we're okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Hold tight. We're going to make sure our neighborhood association, if they are wanting to testify, uh, the West Valley Neighborhood Association, Julie Herman, I don't think is expected to testify and not online and not in chambers. So with that, uh, we'll turn it over to the commission for any questions. I'm sorry? For the Neighborhood Association? Staff, <laughs> are um, you a representative of that neighborhood association? Okay, that's that's that answers that question. So when it comes time for testimony, we'd love to have you come join us. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. All right, uh, let's go back to the commission. Any questions from any of you, Mr. Chairman? Who's that? Uh, Commissioner Torres. Um, I have a question for staff. Um, if you go back a few slides, I think there was uh, on one of the slides, there was a recommended pedestrian pathway or rec represented recommended pedestrian uh, access on there. Can you, t can you t talk about why that was recommended and not required as part of the recommended approval? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Torres. Um, so, so the, Providing a, a pedestrian pathway to the right of way would be required. Um, the recommendation was, and maybe I can zoom in here, but to uh, provide a more direct path. Whereas um, you can see in red, the originally proposed pedestrian connection um, came south once it passed by Um, so in this image, you can see that the originally proposed is in red, where it comes down and, and follows the existing curbing. Um, the recommend, re, uh, recommended condition of approval was just to um, delineate that connection uh, more north so that those two points are connected. Thank you. And um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Torres, just to, just to um, clarify, it is a recommended uh, pedestrian connection um, through the conditions of approval. So it would be required once um, the application would be approved. Matt, can you follow up? What what is the what is the actual connection? Is it concrete and we're gonna put a concrete ribbon through an asphalt parking lot or is it paint? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Danley, in order to allow flexibility with the design, uh, the condition reads specifically that there needs to be a change in material and or painting. So um, with, with that, there's, there's some uh, leniency to how they delineate what space is intended for cars and, and what should be intended for, for people. So Bart, can you explain on that? Are you, is the intent to eliminate those two parking stalls and that where where that connection is being made is it going to be can you can you elaborate on what your thinking is is in terms of how to make that connection that also would require a ramp to be built on either end of that hey there um the um the way it was explained to us is that we needed to articulate a pathway, a safe pathway for people to travel through the property. There is a sidewalk around the, the church building and there's uh, those parking islands you can see. And so we needed to delineate where we would recommend people walk through so that there's a sort of visual way to articulate where there may be pedestrians. And so um, the uh, as, as it was explained to us, we would be articulating that through paint, uh, through identifying sort of that this is the walking uh, pathway, um, a recommended way of getting from one point um, to another. Um, we weren't planning on um, constructing a sidewalk per se um, to get through. Okay. 
Uh, other questions? Mr. Chair. Mr. Mooney. A question for staff, Matt. Um, just so I understand this better, the the legal arrangement between LEAP and uh, King of Glory Church for the long term is, is uh, for, let's say King of Glory decides to sell their property. Does that change anything in this uh, scenario, legally or otherwise? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Mooney, I believe that that's a question better suited for the applicant. Sure. Um, Commissioner, the, um, the property is planned to be purchased. Um, so LEAP will take uh, deeded ownership in the flag lot. And then um, the relationship as it relates to parking and access uh, will exist underneath of a cross access agreement that will be recorded against both properties. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Any other questions? I'm going to ask you one more about this island thing. I think I want to make sure I understand this. Can you tell me are the islands that, um, I guess, what is in them right now? The pedestrian connection discussion that we were having a moment ago. Those two, are, are they landscaped or are they hardscaped? What's the deal with the two of them? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, yes. If you can pull up the aerial, that'd be great. And replace Matt with AI here soon. <laughs> there, it's, there we go. That's as good as it's going to be. You can see it's curved with just a little bit of landscape. So there's landscaping in the both of them. One has a tree in it. Okay. 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 Mr. Chair, Commissioner Denley, I'll also add that the the delineated picture uh, showing that recommended area is not uh, a set in stone relocation. So that was more of a, a recommendation. The The condition word specifically that it needs, the pathway needs to provide a more direct path. So that was just a recommended um, way to get more direct, but that is definitely open to, um, you know, where, where exactly that, that can be uh, placed. Great. Okay. Thank you, Matt. All right. I don't see Commissioner Mooney's hands up. Anybody else in the chambers? Are we good? Okay. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and go to the general public. And it looks like I have somebody signed up here. So uh, Becky Newberry, come on up. And then the gentleman who um, made the great point earlier, I guess you could be on deck because there's nobody else signed up. And we'll see if anybody's online. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, Ms. Newberry, uh, your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. I'm Becky Newberry. Uh, my address is 8907 West Creighton Drive in Boise. Um, I did uh, submit a letter of support, uh, but I felt it was important for me to come in person as well because I'm president of the congregation at King of Glory Lutheran Church. And um, I have traveled with our congregation through um, most of this journey for about the last year and a half, as well as our previous uh, president of the, of the um, congregation. And we find that our congregation is very, very committed to this partnership. And uh, we, um, we want to do everything in our power to be good neighbors because we think it's God's backyard as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you coming out. Go ahead and come on up and state your name and address for the record for, for us, sir. Mr. Chair and uh, members of the commission, thank you for letting me speak this Can evening. Can I have you speak up just a little bit? And, yeah, yes. And, yeah, here we go. I'm Jonathan Melby, and uh, I live at 2924 North Maywood Avenue, and i uh, I've served as president of the West Bench Neighborhood Association since 2021. As I mentioned earlier, the Neighborhood Association has not taken a position on this project. So today I'll be speaking as an individual. 
Um, I live just uh, south of the project, um, a little less than a half mile away um, for the last 12 years. And uh, for several of those years, uh, my two daughters and I walked past this project area uh, to their bus stop, which is the street just north of, of King of Glory Church. And uh, briefly, I'm very supportive of this project and pleased to see the additional options for affordable housing in West Pench. I really like the pocket style courtyard uh, that uh, this project has. I think those opportunities for neighbors to grow closer connections and not just face each other's garages. It's a really beautiful thing. And I was pleased to see that in this plan. Um, as for uh, transit, um, I uh, myself, whenever I can, bike to the nearby Winco and uh, of this place having the uh, bicycle places and uh, the minor, minor exception to allow the 0.5 of a additional house on the acreage, um, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, lastly, it's a big improvement over the field of goat heads that currently lives there. And uh, I'd like to uh, close by thanking uh, King of Glory and Leap for their kindness and uh, caring for our community. And I hope that the uh, commission chooses to approve this project. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anybody else in the chamber who wants to testify on this side? Okay. Anybody online turning our attention? I don't see anybody's hand raised. Crystal, you don't either. Okay. Unless there's anybody else, last call. Okay. In this case, the applicant, uh, Bart, you can come back up and we can rebut the two people who want your project if you'd like. <laughs> I mean, they said it better than I could, but... Uh... Uh, yeah, we th we think this is just a unique uh, opportunity to sort of make a drop in the bucket of um, the kind of critical need for this type of housing in the community. Um, so uh, we we just uh, you know continue to encourage the commission's approval uh, of this application, and we accept the conditions um, that have been asked of us in this application. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you very much. This concludes the public hearing portion. The item is before the commission. We are a decision-making body for the conditional use permit that's been applied for item number three, PUD 23-33. Looking for a motion from the commission. Mr. Chairman, I will give it a shot, but go easy on me. Commissioner Torres. <laughs> I move that we approve PUD 23-33 uh, um, per the conditions of the staff report. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Torres and a second by Commissioner Seha. Commissioner Torres, you would want to kick us off? Yeah, I looking over this project, I mean, I like what, what it's trying to do here to add more housing in, as it was described, a field of goat heads. <laughs> um, also, you know, I, I, I'm very appreciative of seeing that we're looking at AMI as far as housing in a project. If we're going to meet the housing goals of the city, we really need to have more affordable housing being built that people can afford um, at lower AMIs. Um, obviously, 60% is not the lowest, but it's certainly an improvement over um, a lot of things that are out there. Um, I also like the design of it with the, the courtyard and the proximity to transit and the um, emphasis on bike pad connections and all that. And I just think it's it's a good project and I'm hoping that we can approve it in, See how it goes. Okay, great. Any other comments? Um, I just want to say, say how. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> I'm still new. <laughs> We're all good. Go ahead. Just making Dabby. sure the records got it. Oh no, you can just making sure I recognize you. Um, thank you, Chairman Downey. Mm -hmm. So I will be supporting the motion. Uh housing uh in the in our community is a challenge not just in Boise, but in the Treasure Valley. And I really appreciate it, appreciate this collaborative, innovative effort to help with the housing challenges in our community. So thank you both to um, the um, Lutheran Church and to LEAP for uh, bringing this before us. Wonderful. Any other comments? Commissioner Moore. 
So I'll, I'll just be brief, but I think um, I'm in support of the motion. I think it's a great product. Looking at, you know, our packet page 188, the overall view is very different from what we're seeing in the neighborhood. I'm seeing a lot of single family detached, maybe some duplexes and triplexes and things like that. But having this kind of pocket park, which is relatively unique for Boise in general, um, kind of tucked back in, in this back underutilized portion of of the church property and especially the portion that abuts other residential i think it's very appropriate i think it's it's very unique and and it's just a different product than what we're seeing in that area so i'm in support of the motion great thank you commissioner moore any other comments All right, i'll make mine real quick and that is just the item that was brought up by commissioner torres with respect to the connection um normally i would be uh all over that and have a concern. This one is very different, however, because this is a church parking lot and the vast majority of the time that parking lot is empty. And so I don't anticipate, even if you stripe it, anybody's gonna necessarily use it, right? They're gonna go wherever the heck people wanna walk um, because especially given again, that most of the time it's gonna be empty. Um, I, I would anticipate that just making sure that you're careful um, and you're going to make need to make sure you have some ramps coming in and off on and off the property. But that's, you know, compliance anyway. Um, but normally I would get care. But in this case, your, your folks who live there are going to tell you where they want to walk, not necessarily your stripe. So um, I don't have a concern. With, otherwise, I echo the commissioner's um, comments. This is a wonderful project. Um, and I look forward to hopefully more institutions just like your own do more of these types of things with the land that we have because we need it. And I think it's a good win-win for everybody around. So, all right, if there's no other comments, I'm gonna have the clerk call the roll. Danley. Aye. Moore. Aye. Mooney. Aye. Seha. Aye. Torres. Aye. Dome. Aye. All in favor, motion carries. Okay, thank you everybody. This concludes tonight's meeting.